Donald Fraser is here. He insisted on waiting to see you. This man is tired. Donald is short of sleep, and it looks as if he didn't even bother to undress before going to bed. Mr. Paro, I don't know why I'm here. You wanted to talk, and you came to find the only man capable of hearing you. Mr. Paro, since Betty's death, I've doubts about myself. I don't know what to do. And I keep having a horrible dream three nights in a row. Have a drink, and tell me about this dream. It's always the same. I'm on the beach with Betty. I grab her around the throat, and I squeeze, and squeeze until she's dead. Her head falls back, and I see that it's no longer Betty. It's Megan's face. Have you seen Megan Barnard recently? Yes, our grief has brought us together. I never really knew her before. She's really quite a remarkable girl. But I would never tell her about my dream. Why not? Is it her you are attacking in your dream? No, it's Betty. And once Betty is dead, it's Megan's face that appears in its place. Very interesting. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. Mr. Fraser, I think that the real meaning of this dream is that you are in love with Megan Barnard. Please go on. Do. This dream certainly betrays your guilt. Oh. But what do you feel guilty about? Having killed your fiancé? Possible. Or forgetting her very quickly for her sister? Certainly. And this forgetting is perceived as a second death. So you don't really think I was the one who killed Betty? I do not exclude this theory. I am simply saying that I do not need to know that fact to explain your dream and your guilt. Thank you for being frank, Mr. Poirot. You've helped me a great deal. I'm going back to Bexhill. I'll not take any more of your time up. It is late, Mr. Fraser, and you are tired. I'll sleep on the train. I like trains. It's easy to sleep rock by the sound of the wheels. Poor boy, he seems completely lost. Well, women seem to like him. I think Megan will take care of him. Oh, I remember. Did you order the product I needed? Yes, we'll be receiving it tomorrow. Bien, it is late. And I ask Miss Gray to come tomorrow morning. I have a few questions I wish to ask her.
Mademoiselle, I asked you here in order to answer a very important question. Am I right in thinking you said that you did not speak to anyone on the day Sir Carmichael was murdered? It's the absolute truth. Yet, Lady Clark maintained that she saw you talking to a stranger on the front doorstep. Really? She must have been mistaken. Oh, I remember now. I'd forgotten all about it, but it wasn't important. It was just a salesman. One of those traders who sell stockings from door to door. Can you describe him to me? Medium size, mm, glasses, dark suit, and a felt hat. Not the sort of man you notice. Completely harmless. That's why I forgot all about him. Nothing else? He was very hesitant and shy. Usually door-to-door -door salesmen are very confident, but he wasn't. You did not leave Cheston willingly, I believe. I don't wish to lie. Lady Clark did not appreciate my presence. And Franklin? Cannot go against the wishes of a sick lady. He is a good man. And he worries a great deal about his sister-in-law. I noticed that you left some personal belongings behind at Cheston. Are you planning on going back to collect them? No. I prefer not to carry the weight of the past. Yeah. I must ask you one last question. Please reply frankly with either yes or no. If Lady Clark had died, would you have agreed to marry Sir Carmichael if he'd ask you? How dare you ask such a question? Sir Carmichael treated me just like his daughter. And all that I ever felt him was affection and gratitude, nothing else. Thank you, mademoiselle. I will not keep you any longer. I met Thora Gray on the stairs. Her cheeks were ablaze, and she appeared to be deeply hurt. Poirot, have you offended the poor girl again? Do you have good reasons for accusing her? I accused her of nothing, Hastings. I simply asked her an important question she did not answer. Let us see if we can answer it for her. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work.
You must know how to read between the lines, Hastings. When Sir Carmichael refers to paternal affection, he is lying to himself. Read this engraving on the brooch. A dark dragon for an angel with glossy hair. These are the words of a lover, not a father. Lady Clark was not wrong. What if Sir Carmichael had fallen in love with his secretary? That doesn't mean that she forced him to do so. True, there are extenuating circumstances. She is a penniless orphan. But she's calculating. Just look how she avoided it when asked if she would have married Clark. I see. You think she seduced Sir Carmichael for her own gain, and that now she is doing the same with his brother. Praro, your world is a very dark place. Do not get carried away, mon ami. We have another more important matter to settle. Really? Yes. Would you believe that Miss Grey taught me something new? Let us now try and get our brain cells to work.
It's perfectly clear, Hastings. Perfectly clear. Indeed, a stocking seller visited Andover, Bexhill, and Churston on the day of each murder. We have our suspect. This should be of interest to Jop. Chief Inspector, we are looking for a stocking salesman. I see you have a suspect? Yes. Contact all the stocking call sellers who may employ him. Your suspect is a salesman? No, he does not take orders. He sells door to door. Right. The hunt is on. Are you leaving, Mr. Cust? Yes, I'm going to Cheltenham. You shouldn't travel today. You don't look very well. I have to. I... I have engagements. I must respect them. Can you get the post, Hastings? And why don't you go and get it yourself? Très bien. What's going on? I've never known Hastings to be so disagreeable. Are you collecting the post, Poirot? Poor Mr. Poirot. I'm quite sorry for you. If at first you don't succeed, Ty... Try again. We've a long way to go still. Typerary? No, that comes later. Letter T. The next little incident will take place in Doncaster on September 11th. So long. ABC. I should compare this letter with the one on my desk which I received earlier to see if it does indeed come from the same person. Let us examine this more closely. Certain characters in the toilet. Yes, this eye is weird. Yes, the eye characters in the two letters do indeed have the same defects. 
I have to find some other sim. Hmm. The W. Of course, the W characters in the two letters do indeed have the same defects. I have to find some other similar defects to confirm my theory. Let us examine the characters in this world. Nothing to report for these characters. Let us examine another world. Let us examine the characters in this world. No, this character does not appear to have any defects. Let us examine another world. Yes, the A appears to be quite unusual. That's right. The A characters in the two letters do indeed have the same defects. My theory was right. These two letters were written with the same typewriter. Hastings, he strikes tomorrow. Chief Inspector Jap? He's on another line. Can I take a message? Yes, please, mademoiselle. It is from Hercule Poirot. Tell him ABC strikes tomorrow in Doncaster. He must call me back. Very well, sir. Bien, now I'm going to see what I can find from these burnt documents. I've received the product I need. Hastings, if you do not mind, I would like you to take a few notes. Yes, yes. Royal Mathematical and Statistical Society's Bulletin, September the 9th, 1935. The Alphabet Murder, a Methodical Madman. It's highly probable that the Alphabet Murderer will kill again. Could we possibly estimate the number of victims in his next crime? Yes, and it is easy. As soon as we know the ratio of towns, cities and villages whose names begin with a D, and the ratio of English people whose names are spelled the same. On the one hand, the ratio of towns, cities and villages in England with the names starting with D, and on the other hand, the ratio of English people with a name also starting with D. After this initial calculation, it is easy to deduce the likelihood of actually being murdered if you belong to the target population. Go to the last page to find our results and details on the calculations. Daily Blague, August 31, 1935. Moustache at half-mast. Poirot's repeated failure in ABC case. Sometimes small things trouble great men. Hastings, faithful collaborator of the Belgian detective, knows something about it. Three mornings in a row, he confided to us, the cook broke the egg yolks when preparing Poirot's breakfast. This apparently casual event has greatly disturbed my friend, to the point it breaks his concentration and slows his judgment. I also noticed his moustache, of which he is so proud, being duller than usual. Poirot, I assure you, I haven't said any such thing to the journalists. They twist everything. Hmm. Hastings' photo album. He is very proud of his bag. Churston, Devon. Population 500 inhabitants. 
Hourly of trains. London Truston. Trains of evening. London, 6.45 p.m. Newton about 11 a.m. Truston, 11.45 a.m. London, 11.45 p.m. Newton about 6.08 a.m. Truston, 7.15 a.m. So, how are you getting on? I'm ready to take notes. Now, down to work. What of this needs putting in order a little? This page will be reconstructed in a flash. This page is finished. That's done. Three more to go. This page is finished. And that's too done. It's easier than I thought. This page is finished. Only one more. Keep going. This page will be reconstructed in a flash. This page is child's play. This page is finished. All the pages are reconstructed. A bottle of solvent. A dry cloth. A dry cloth. A bottle of solvent. The cloth is now soaked with solvent. Got it! Make a note, Hastings, make a note. Mrs. Alice Asha, sharp owner in Andover. Tracheitis, hemoptysis, prescribed laudanum. I got it. Look. Poirot, where on earth did you find these files? On a fire at the bottom of the garden at Comside. All right, but where did the person who burned them find them? Alice Asher, shopkeeper in Hendover. Tracatis? Hemoptysis, 
chronic cough with loss of blood. Prescribed laudanum-based cough medicine. Betty Barnard, waitress in Bexhill. Chronic bronchitis, causing dysphonia. Advice to stop smoking. Alexander Bonaparte cast. While wounded, mustard gas and head trauma. Pulmonary emphysema. Hemoptysis. Coughing fits with blood. Suffers from absences and amnesia. Dick Dudley Dunbar, owner of the Black Swan Hotel in Doncaster. Asthmatic, heart disease, heart condition. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. The burned documents are medical records and without a doubt they come from Clark's archives. First of all, because all the patients have salt conditions. And secondly, their name starts with either A, B, C or D. And it is precisely the files that match these letters that have been tampered with. But why burn these files? How come the names of the two victims appear on them? And who are the two other patients? These are very good questions. Chief Inspector. You wanted a stocking seller? We have one. Reported by his landlady who thought he was behaving suspiciously. He has the most unbelievable name. Alexander Bonaparte Cust. Yes, Alexander Bonaparte Cust. How did you guess? Poro, you have magical powers. It's a serious lead. I called Doncaster. A person matching Cust's description has been seen at the station. He got off the train from London, but after that, nobody knows where he went. Look for him at the Black Swan Hotel. What? How do you know he's there? Trust me, Chief Inspector. You appear to be very sure of yourself. Very well. I'll call the Black Swan straight away. The owner is going to get a shock when he learns that there's a murderer under his roof. Chief Inspector, I would rather call myself. As you wish. Please go ahead. Hello, the Black Swan. Hercule Poirot here. May I speak to the owner? Speaking. Dick Dudley Dunbar. How can I help you? Is there Mr. Cust among your guests? He arrived today. Shall I call him for you? No, it is you I wish to speak with. But who is this Cust? A crook. A crook? He seems such a decent chap. Do you think that cust might be dangerous? Oh, I do hope you're wrong. He seems so harmless, you know. Yes, completely harmless. We must not overestimate the danger. After all, we are not absolutely sure he is guilty. 
should I do? Watch him. If he leaves the hotel, watch where he is heading. I'll call the police in Doncaster immediately. When they arrive, keep out of the way. Oh, indeed. I shall keep out of the way. I have a bad heart, you see, and a big shot could kill me. Thank you for having warned me. Hello, Poirot. We have some good news. The police in Doncaster have caught our man at the Black Swan Hotel. They're sending him here by train. While we're waiting to question Cust, we could search his room in London. Where does he live? The Marbury Guest House. I'll see you there. Yes, but start without me. First of all, I have to sort out a few details for Cust's transfer. I understand. A bientôt. Hastings, we are making good progress. Please go and search the room of our number one suspect. With pleasure. I did have a dentist appointment, but I'll cancel. The dentist. So that is why you are so nervous and bad-tempered. A visit to the dentist is never an enjoyable prospect. But an unavoidable one. Go to your appointment, Hastings. I will manage on my own. To Marbury Guest House, please. What do you do? You must be Mr. Hercule Poirot. Chief Inspector Chubb told me that you might be coming. Madame, you may be of valuable help to me. It would be my pleasure to help you. Will there be some journalists there as well? I think you might even be interviewed. You are a key witness. I've suspected him for some time, but he appeared so harmless. Oh yes, sometimes he got angry and waved his arms about. But even then, he wasn't frightening. And he was as gentle as a lamb again immediately afterwards. It was only this morning that I understood. He told me he was going to Cheltenham, but my daughter saw him at Euston Station. It's not the right station. To get to Cheltenham, you have to take the train from Paddington. And what's more, Mr. Cuss left behind an ABC with Doncaster underlined. As you can imagine, when I saw that, I called Scotland Yard. Well done. You were right. He did go to Doncaster. So I was right to warn the police. Uh, tell me, did you have any other reason to suspect Mr. Cust? Well, he's odd. Sometimes he coughs really loudly and complains that his throat is burning, and sometimes he talks to himself and stares into space. He told me that it was because of a wound he got in the war. His head hasn't been quite right since, he said. And then he was in Churston when that millionaire got murdered. I found his train ticket when I washed his coat. He didn't want me to wash his shirt. He washed it himself. But I did see big brown stains on it. Do you think it was blood? Well, when I saw them, I thought, look, he spilled his wine or his soup all over himself. But now that I think about it, well, they did look like blood. Cut used to travel for his work. Is that correct? Oh, it wasn't for pleasure. He was always on well on trains. But he had to sell his stockings around England. I have to respect my engagements, he used to say. Do you know where Kirst was at the time of the murder in Andover and Bexhill? On June the 21st and July the 25th? No, I don't know. That was a while ago, you know. 
But surely you keep a register. It won't do you much good. Mr. Cuss rents his room for the year. If he goes away for a few days, I have no reason to make a note of it. Ah! I remember one thing. Bexer's by the sea, right? Indeed. It is a large seaside resort. Well, as it happens, at the start of July, Mr. Cast asked me to repair his bathing dress. Suspicious, huh? Very interesting. Please continue. I also forgot to say that he started buying newspapers that talked about the case. When did he start buying the newspapers? Let's see. I think it was just after the millionaire's murder in Churston. He didn't seem all that interested before that. That would be all for now. I'm going to take a look at his room. Take the key on the counter. This woman appears to be in a good mood. Mrs. Marbury is in a good mood. She is working very precisely in producing incredibly thin peel. It looks like I found the real master of this house. There is no need to worry about the household cat. I'm sure that Mrs. Marbury lets it do what it pleases. I don't think my register will help you. Mr. Cuss rents his room all year. If he goes away for a few days, I have no reason to make a note of it. The truth is becoming apparent, and I have something to say to Mrs. Marbury. I have something to say to Mrs. Marbury. Mrs. Marbury, if I am to believe the register, you rented room 306 to a certain Mr. Fishman on the day of the Bexil murder? Room 306 is Cust's room. Can you explain yourself? Yes, I remember. Just for one night as a favor, Mr. Cust was away, all my other rooms were taken, and poor Mr. Fishman had nowhere to go. It doesn't matter, provided that you remember to change the sheets. Oh, do you think so? This dark stain. It could be blood, but goodness knows how long it has been there.
Laudanum Cameron's Chemists. Laudanum, a medicine for coughs. It is what Dr. Clark prescribed for Mrs. Asher. This subject will probably be useful to me. Diethyl barbituric acid, Johnson Company. I know this medicine. It is a powerful sedative. This subject would probably be useful to me. How oh, hopeful. This place is a real mess. The least we can say that Mr. Cust is not very concerned about order and balance. John Milligan, Managing Director, Silky Legs, Frederick Street, Leicester. To A.B. Cust, Marbury's Guest House, 1935, May the 21st. Dear Sir, Further to our letters dated 5th and 10th of the month, we confirm we are you as door-to-door -door salesman, according to the conditions stated in our previous letters. We will send you the articles by mail and also a Redfield typewriter you will be using for every business letter. Regarding the schedule of your rounds, please do as following. June 21, Andover. Arrive by train the 20th in the evening and get a room at Station Hotel. Start your turn in the north part of the town. This letter establishes that Cust went to Endover, but the ink has hidden the destinations of his other trips. <sighs> I know from Mrs. Marbury that he went to Churston. I just have to show that he went to Bexhill and I will have proved that he was present at all the crime scenes. Did Cust drop it when he opened the window, or was it Mrs. Marbury while she was cleaning? Cust is parsimonious. He keeps his pencils and sharpens them until there is nothing left. It is clear that he did not grow up in luxury. It's an ABC. A long bladed knife, a murderer's weapon. This subject would probably be useful to me. I have to get the ribbon. How am I going to do it? right hand heel has been removed. Something is blocking the ribbon. The left hand heel has been removed. Something is blocking the ribbon. Something is blocking. Something is blocking the ribbon. Something is blocking the ribbon.
Something is blocking the ribbon. And here is the ribbon. Let us see if it was indeed used to write the letters sent by ABC. I only need the ink ribbon for my inquiry. I will let Jack clean the keyboard if he wishes. And here is the ribbon. Let us see if it was indeed used to write the letters sent by ABC. I only need the ink ribbon for my inquiry. I will let Jack clean the keyboard if he wishes. All the letters announcing the murders were written on Cust's typewriter. ABC guys, enough to sign about a dozen murders. This knife is very useful. Who knows, maybe it never cut anything other than string. Bexhill Daily Paper, dated from the day of the Bexhill murder. Trousers, white shirts, everything has been washed very well. Most probably the basting dress repaired by Mrs. Marbury's expert hands. All the main articles referring to the ABC case are here, from the Churston murder onwards. Nothing before that date. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. The register shows that Cust did not sleep at the guest house on the day of the murder. Where was he? Bexhill. The Bexhill paper reveals it. Cust bought this newspaper in Bexhill on July the 25th. No use continuing the inspection of this room. I've seen all there is to see. Goodbye, Mrs. Marbury. Thank you for your help. Bye. Ah, Chief Inspector. I was about to leave. Good evening, Chief Inspector. Welcome. Please excuse me. I must go to the kitchen. I'll leave the key of Mr. Cust on the counter. I'm sorry I'm late. I've spent ages with the Doncaster police. And you? I have established one fact. On three occasions, Cust was at the scene on the day of the crimes. Ah. 
I had best talk to Jab. I've listened closely to what you have to say, Poro. For me, there's no doubt Cust is guilty. Do you have any element that might prove the contrary? That is what we're going to look for. Let us now try and get our brain cells to work. The evidence against Cust is overwhelming. His presence at the scenes, the knife, the bloodstained shirt, the ABCs in a box. C'est vrai. However, the blood Mrs. Marbury saw on Cust's shirt may have been his own. According to his medical records, he suffers from hemoptysis. The murderer cuts a Carmichael throat from behind and the blood spurted outwards. You would expect the murderer's shirt to be stained on the sleeves, not on the buttonholes. Yet we see quite the opposite. You would expect the murderer to keep the newspaper articles about his crimes. But Cust's collection starts in Cheston, as if it discovered the case rather late. Hmm, I agree it's troubling, but it doesn't change my mind. There's small details that we should be able to clear up by questioning Cust. When can you talk to him? Doncaster is sending him to us on the first train. Are they questioning him already? He says he can't remember a thing. It's plausible. Doctor Say suffers from absences and amnesia. Mrs. Marbury has confirmed this. He may have done the murders in an altered state. A familiar situation. It's not enough to clear his name. Doctor Thompson insisted that even if you don't know what you're doing, you never commit a murder without wanting to. Très intéressant. I shall remember that. Right. I'll go and examine the suspect's room. Chief Inspector, I took the liberty of removing a few clues to examine at home. All right, we'll discuss them tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm going to see if you've missed something. Scotland Yard, please. 